Oh, I'm uh, very glad to wish you all welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of uh, Sciences and today's Gordon Goodman Memorial Lecture. The Academy is an independent organization with the overall objective to promote the sciences and strengthen their influence in society. Uh, and we do this in different ways. In addition to serving as a forum where researchers can meet across uh, subject borders, we reward prominent, uh, reward prominent research by d distinguished prizes. I guess you all know that we are fortunate to f reward uh, several of the Nobel Prizes from this academy. We arrange uh, international scientific uh, contacts and, uh, and meetings of various kinds. And, as I said, we act as a voice of science, of science in society and uh, work to influence the importance of science in, uh, in society and uh, po political uh, decision-making and such activities. Uh, the Academy has a high profile in uh, sustain sustainability and environmentally related uh, Questions. And this includes uh, climate change and uh, global warming, and the closely uh, related question about production and supply of energy to an increasing world population. Uh, the Academy is hosting uh, a number of institutes and uh, organizations. Uh, this includes uh, the International Secretariat for the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, IGBP and, uh, of course, the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics, which, as you all know, probably is a leading international research institute where Gordon Goodman was the first director. Uh, we also host, of course, the Swedish Secretariat for Environmental Earth System Sciences, CES, one of the co-organizers of this afternoon's lecture and discussion. And in this connection, I also would take the opportunity to mention the, our recently established MISTRA Council for Evidence-Based Environmental Management, EVEM, which works to promote evidence-based environmental management. And all these acti activities, as well as several others within the environmental sustainability field, are coordinated through the Academy's Committee for Environmental Questions, which serves as a reference and node and contact point for the Academy. As you have understood now, the topic of today's lecture and the discussion is very much in line with this profile of the Academy. And it's therefore a pleasure for us to serve as a host for this afternoon. And we now we look all forward to a very interesting uh, afternoon together. I now want to leave the word to Neda Farabakshasad, who is a science advisor at the Swedish Secretariat for, uh, Environ Secretariat for Environmental Earth System Sciences, the CES. Please, Neda. Madam Minister, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Swedish Secretariat for Environmental Earth System Sciences, I welcome you to this Gordon Goodman Memorial Lecture. We cannot talk about Gordon Goodman and his efforts to promote sustainable development without realizing that to face our environmental and socioeconomical challenges, <clears throat> we need collaboration. Collaboration between science and policy, between research and development, and between North and South, and among a wide range of other actors. Our Secretariat is actually a small model of collaboration itself. It is a partnership between Swedish research funders, the Academy, and the Swedish International Development Agency, CEDA. Together, we work to link better the Swedish science with international programs and initiatives. We try to communicate global change issues with policy and decision makers. 
and we promote research collaboration between North and South on the issues of global environmental change and sustainable development. Organizing this seminar together with SCI and the Academy gives us the opportunity to learn and to discuss how science and development and policy could and should interact. And who could better discuss these issues with us than Professor Tibayuka? Thank you again, and uh, I would like now to give the floor to my colleague Robert Watt from uh, Stockholm Environment Institute for his welcoming notes. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Nida. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Watt. I'm Director of Communications at uh, Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, before I uh, welcome our keynote speaker, the Honourable Professor Anna Tibajuka, to the stage, I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Gordon Goodman. Um, Gordon was born in Wales. Um, he was born among the rolling hills of Wales, but also the coal mines of Wales. And uh, this environment uh, left a uh, an impression on him uh, throughout his life and I think is, is an illustration of how he was committed and interested not only in the natural environment but also in man's and woman's impression and footprint that they leave on the natural environment and the interrelation between people and nature. And that interest is one that he carried with him throughout the whole of his life. Um, and indeed, it has set its mark on SEI. Uh, he was the first executive director of Stockholm Environment Institute. And we uh, at SEI very much try and uh, work on the interface between people and nature to understand the interactions between the two of them. Something else that uh, marked out Gordon was, his, was the fact that he was, he was somehow before his own time. He was very interested in gathering data and understanding things about people and environment and talked about evidence-based decision-making, about the way in which uh, scientific research can support um, the public policy-making. And he was talking about that way before Bono of U2 talked about uh, uh, factivists, which we heard just recently. He was somehow way before his time. And again, that's something that's left its mark at SEI, where we believe that scientific insights can be brought to bear on public policy and can help us in our journey towards sustainable development. Now, this is a, a bit of a, a, a relay race here, and, and we're almost over, and I can hand the baton very shortly over to uh, our keynote speaker. And, and as with all relay races, the, the last person in the relay race is really the most talented, the one who can run the fastest. And it is a huge pleasure to be able to invite to the stage the Honourable Professor Anna Tibajuka, who really has a unique experience and insight into uh, some of those issues around the interaction of humans and environment uh, through not only her current role as a minister in the Tanzanian government, but also through her long experience working as uh, the director of UN Habitat. And it's great pleasure to be able to invite uh, uh, Minister uh, Tibajuka to the stage. Um, give her a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for that kind, those kind of remarks. Uh, your Excellencies, the distinguished uh, participants to this afternoon's address, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by saying that I'm so pleased to be here. I'm actually honored to be here, and I have to start by saying that Ambassador Bushelen invited me. I found him at Alanda waiting, and he's spoiling me. So it's good that I'm leaving this afternoon. Please give him a hand of applause on my behalf. <laughs> so my dear friends, as the countdown to 2015 has started and in vogue, it is no longer whether to achieve the Millennium Development Goals 
but what to do next after them. We meet here in Stockholm to commemorate and honor a great scholar, a visionary, a humanist, and environmentalist. Gordon Goodman, as we have just heard, like his name, he was indeed a good man who lived a good life and spent his intellect and energies in service of mankind, in pursuit of a better world. A man born ahead of his time, I must say, Gordon coined the word sustainable development long before the majority of mankind could contemplate its importance, let alone appreciate how the, that mission would come to be humanity's single most important challenge. I thank the Stockholm Environmental Institute and the organizers for the honor of inviting me as the lead speaker on such an auspicious occasion. I apologize that my, given my reality, I could, not, I, I could not be able to give you my text before this afternoon. But I promise to make up for that here and now. So ladies and gentlemen, Gordon Goodman spent his life working, as we all know, for sustainable development. In my case, fate would later put me at center stage of working on one forgotten aspect of that subject matter, namely sustainable urbanization. For in 1998, I had left my home country, Tanzania, and applied for a job to work for the United Nations in its Trade and Development Secretariat in Geneva. I was then the director of the Office of the Least Developed Countries in charge of preparing government people from my part of the world in trade negotiations at the WTO. But alas, my tenure in Geneva was to be short-lived because the then Secretary General of the United Nations of the day, Mr. Kofi Annan, had wanted an economist working on urban issues and urban poverty. So in 2000, I was transferred from Geneva to work in Nairobi and landed at the Habitat Center. So against that backdrop, I found myself in what was then mission impossible. How was I going to convince the world that our future is urban, and that if we are going to make any progress, we have to sort out the urban environment. So the statistics speak for themselves. The rural population was at 63% in 1970. By the year 2000, we are becoming an urban species. And by 2030, even Africa will no longer be a rural continent. The majority of Africans we have crossed in two cities and towns. So the future is urban. We say Homo sapiens is now Homo urbanus. So against that backdrop, I said, how the hell am I going to position myself here to do this work? But luckily, in that very year of 2000, when I was moved to Nairobi, the heads of state meeting, a summit meeting in New York passed the Millennium Declaration, and with it, the MDGs. Particularly, Goal 7 was titled as Environmental Sustainability, and under, under it were three targets of interest this afternoon. Biodiversity, one on safe drinking water, and the other was on slum upgrading. This is what was packaged by the world leaders as environmental sustainability. I felt this framework offered a wonderful opportunity to do my work. And I then continued to conceptualize and put up a frame without, within which we could now promote sustainable development, working on sustainable urbanization. So the focus is on health, on livelihoods, and on target 11, also called slum upgrading. In a more abstract sense, you can look at it like that from the world of science and research. That the urban slum, like the elephant in the 
Indian folk tale or in the African folklore has been discovered by six experts, each wearing the blinkers of professional bias, of course. The first expert describes the slum as potholed streets, dilapidated shanties, and lack of water and sanitation. And for those of you not familiar with my part of the world, let me say this is our challenge. People moving very quickly into cities and towns. So if we don't put our act together, we are going to end up that will be the slum population over the years. It would mean that by 2020, when the, the Millennium Development Goal on slums will be evaluated, because while the others are ending on 2015, the one on slums was considered as a, an enormous challenge, so the heads of states gave themselves slightly more time. So this is where we expect, the, under business as usual scenario, the slum population will keep growing. By 2050, if you can think that far, uh, this is likely to be the scenario. So, where do we find these slum dwellers? The majority, the depth of the slum populations, over 262 million is found in sub-Saharan Africa. Here, almost 70% of the urban poor are living in slums and informal settlements. Then you have Southeast Asia, etc. So this is how it looks like according to the UN Habitat projections. And uh, as if, as you are all aware, speaking at this uh, distinguished scientific community, you know that climate change has not made things easy for anybody. And what is happening is that we have now uh, environmental variability, so the incidence of, of disasters of all sorts are playing themselves out there, complicating our story. So, natural and human-made disasters. There are some people who have argued that there are hardly any natural-made disasters. Some, somewhere humans are a culprit, whether directly or indirectly. But uh, we can see that this is a challenge facing us. But in Africa, and I'm going to be focusing on African perspectives, Based in Nairobi, I decided that my starting point would be in the sprawling settlement called Kibera. For those of you who have been there, this is a satellite image of Kibera, where we have about 750,000 people on only 250 hectares of land. And here you can see the shame of our world. This is a Nairobi Royal Golf Course sitting on top of this land. This used to be the Nairobi Dam. It was one of the most beautiful places, and the people used to come from London to enjoy the Nairobi Dam, but it is no more because it is now all polluted by the effluent, the sewage, you know, the, you know basically the pollution from Kibera. So, inside Kibera, this is life inside Kibera. So you can see that there is vitality. The challenge here, if I go back to our goal, remember, we are seized with goal seven, environmental sustainability. So safe drinking water, how do you provide safe drinking water in this? How do you secure sanitation? You can see solid waste. How do you then improve the shacks? This is some upgrading. How do you improve these kind of structures? But I know it looks quite disappointing, but it is not all in vain. Because look, this also happens in Kibera. There is youth, there are children growing up there, and you can trust children to find funny under any circumstances. So you can find that they are enjoying themselves. So I would like to say that within this background of different professionals, everybody pulling on their side, I did say, and I would like to repeat, that the first expert describes the slum as its pothold streets, which I have shown, the dilapidated shanties, and the lack of water and sanitation. The second one is going to see disease, hunger, 
and literacy. Another expert will join in to say political and economic repression and exploitation of women and the children they support. Another expert could quickly come with a rejoinder, see the slum as a locus of unemployment and refugee for crime. The fifth in terms of environmental degradation and pollution and eyesore on things that we shouldn't see. But the sixth, sleeping off our different intellectual biases will see poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, arriving in Nairobi, I decided to focus on poverty. So this afternoon, I will be concentrating on the challenge of solving urban poverty as a mission to sustainable development. I would like to say that after a half century of treating selected symptoms of poverty, the Millennium Development Goals constitute a first comprehensive attempt by the international community to address this endemic scourge through a consensus on multiple measurable targets. It is remarkable that five of the first 10 Millennium Development Goal targets, namely hunger, child mortality, maternal mortality, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and major diseases, and water and basic sanitation, all relate to improved health. And that the other four, income, primary schooling, gender disparity in education, and loss of environmental resources, improved livelihood, all have linkages to health. So sustainable development is also about delivering health. Target 11, which was my main focus, However, improving the lives of at least 100 million slum dwellers by the year 2020, as I have shown, forced the international community to assign priority status to a specific geography of poverty that until now was neither captured in national statistics nor reflected in urban data. The urban slum target is recognition by the international community that in terms of livelihood and health, Living conditions in urban slums around the world are the worst of the worst. Target 11 is further way, warning that by ignoring the plight of slum dwellers, governments are inadvertently adopting development models that are neither sustainable nor acceptable. So we have about 1 billion slum dwellers at risk, as I have, I have shown. Slums bec are becoming the norm rather than the exception in the poorest cities of the world. The word slums currently house an estimated one billion people, one out of every three urban dwellers. Slums are a physical manifestation of urban poverty and home to most of the world's urban poor. These are human beings who do not benefit from the wealth and opportunities generated by the cities in which they live. So in sub-Saharan Africa, as I have already said, 70% of urban residents live in slums. Many slum dwellers are unable to escape the material deprivation and disease that are normally associated with impoverished rural areas. Asia's cities, if I could add, which host almost 60% of the West slum populations, are becoming sites of a severe environmental degradation and pollution, which are impacting recent economic gains. And despite progressive legislation, and improved governance structures in recent years. Even Latin America's cities remain the most unequal in the world today. So in the next two decades, more than 95% of the population growth in the world's poorest regions will be occur in cities. Urban growth rates are particularly high in the least developed countries, averaging almost 5% per year. A third of the Commonwealth countries, for example, which I analyzed, uh, between 2000 and 2005, urban growth rates between three and six percent were between three and six percent. Africa is the fastest growing continent and has growth rates of about four percent. What does it mean if you have a growth rate of four percent? Basically, it means your population is going to double every 12 years or so, 12 to 15 years, other things being what the population will double. In my own home city of Dar es Salaam, where I'm coming from, this, the town is growing at 4% per annum, and 80% of the population is living in informal settlements. It means the population of the slum, now around 4 million, will double in 15 years from today. So
So if you are not prepared with basic infrastructure, basically, what are you doing if you are not coating disaster? So the situation is out there is quite complex. So the shift of population implies that the major development challenges and the struggle to achieve the MDGs and targets must focus on cities of the developing world, where an increasingly large proportion of the world's poor will live. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that it was difficult for me the 10 years I spent at the UN campaigning on this agenda. As Melinda Fonsudere, who is in the audience, and it's a pleasure to see you, Melinda. Uh, as you know very well, I am trained as a rural economist. So it was hard for me now to transform myself and start campaigning for urban poverty. But because of that background, maybe, I had the humility to be able to say the truth, that while we were focusing on rural development, which we cannot forget, people had voted with their feet and moved on to cities. A number of people in these slums, the shanties that I have shown, they are not necessarily, they have not necessarily abandoned agriculture as a profession, but agriculture has not saved them where they are. So one third of the people in these slums in Africa, they are actually environmental refugees. People have been thrown, prematurely thrown out of their livelihoods because they could not make a living on the farms. And when people cannot make a living in one place, we all know what will happen. Economic theory is very clear. People move not because they will be better off. People move because they expect to be better off. So it is the expectation function that moves people out of place A to place B. And this is the reality that was confronting us. So I would like to say that there had been a misdiagnosis, therefore, of the development problem. This is not to say that we should not focus on rural development. We must focus on rural development. One of the challenges facing Africa is what, of course, we would then call premature urbanization. Conflicts that prevail the continent, for example, have also done their bit in chasing people out of their current occupations into the cities. So the whole notion of survival strategies need to be supported by public policy to make life easier, but also to make life safe. We must fight poverty and not fight the poor, and we have to know the difference. Many policies are harassing poor people. Poor people take care of themselves. There is some arrogance by some of us who feel that we sort out things for the poor. It is only under stress that the poor will not be able to make a living. But of course, unable to make out a living in the rural areas, they then look for urban space. And with this urban space, they have not necessarily been fight, uh, finding secure ten. So the global strategy. The global strategy is that we need national level strategies that are required for all governments to take local action to achieve global goals. The MDGs that are now under review we are global goals. But without local action, you cannot achieve them. So all this has got to be translated so that we work at local level. And uh, long-term sustainable urban planning strategies, definitely something that must be worked on. Medium-term pro poor service the land. When I was working at the UN, when we worked most of these models, I, was not, I didn't know that I was going to emerge as a land minister in Tanzania. So now I have to walk the talk, medium-term, pro poor service land. Is it in supply? Then we have short-term slum upgrading. So you can see that slum upgrading is actually a short-term intervention over what we need is an integrated strategy about adequate shelter, women's inheritance and ownership rights, global campaigns against arbitrary forced evictions, cities without slums programs, tenure, property, rental rights, and you have not. Then we have the question of urban governance, where we look at urban water and sanitation. And I know that we shall be hearing a lot about sanitation. I happen to be the chair of the United Nations Water Supply and uh, Sanitation Collaborative Council, 
And I'm very happy, maybe I should also inform this audience that, as you know, originally, sanitation was not part of the Millennium Declaration. It was added as part of the campaign. And I had the pleasure to join Sir Richard Jolly, who is the founder of the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council, to fight the corridors of New York and Johannesburg and to insert the sanitation target. So some of the slides, some of the campaign you are hearing was instrumental to convince people that if you didn't solve the sanitation problem, you could not solve the health problem. And finally, at Johannesburg in 2002, sanitation was added on the agenda. Then we have the some upgrading facility. It, requires, it remains a challenge of investment because as you can imagine, investing in housing is a resource intensive activity. Investing in urban infrastructure is a resource-intensive activity. So at the moment, I must say since the Stockholm 1972 conference, which discussed housing and municipal finance, uh, the debate then dropped off the radar screen. So at the moment, as I speak, the world has no mechanism for municipal finance because the issue was discussed at the Stockholm conference, which was called, actually, on the human environment although the human part seemed to have fallen off the radar screen. And that's why we lost time. But the first United Nations Conference uh, of Stockholm 1972 was actually convened on the human environment. There were, where there were two working committees, one on the natural environment, which was to prevail, and one was on the built-up environment. That is what became the habitat agenda, but there was never any agreement, and as a result, this particular topic of local governance of municipal finance fell off the screen. So we felt that within that framework, our campaign was therefore to also point out the lacuna, the lack of investment at local level. Cities, towns, secondary towns, which are mushrooming all over the developing world, for example in Africa, at the moment they are on their own. If they want to get investment, they have to negotiate with their treasury, and they are not necessarily the priority of the national government sitting in the capital. Uh, so I would like, st speaking in Stockholm, as I'm doing and honoring uh, Gordon Goodman, who was definitely in Stockholm in 1972, that this is something that I'm throwing uh, to those of you who are in the research uh, field, that please revisit Stockholm 1972. Now, Against that background, and uh, Prof. Ambassador Sher, if my time runs out, just remind me. Let me quickly now try to take you to the business of the day in Tanzania. So what is happening in Tanzania? I have told you the campaign at the global level, and the goals are there, and Sweden, as one of the uh, you know, donor countries, you have been doing your bit. But I would like to say that in Tanzania, what we are doing is reducing the rate of rapid urbanization through agricultural development, foreign investors partnering with the smallholder farmers in the nucleus or outgrower farm arrangements. When we have looked at it all, when we have seen this rapid pace of chaotic urbanization, most of it premature, premature in the sense that urbanization must be followed by advances in agricultural technology. Otherwise, you cannot feed the population. Otherwise, you cannot have the food and fiber you need to feed urban industries. Then, clearly, there is a need to reduce the pace of the influx of people from the countryside into the cities. So this is the approach that we have taken. We have taken, uh, and it, we need a regional approach because we cannot be anywhere. So this program called the the South Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania uh, is one of the pilots that is now uh, on the table, and we hope that we shall also be putting up other growth corridors. Why a growth corridor? A growth corridor because we need transport. Finally, you have to solve this maze. These are the farmers on their own. So the fundamental goal is to increase smallholder incomes and food security. Doing so requires investors who have the capacity to provide the inputs, processing facilities, power and transport needed to link smallholder to global and domestic markets. So 
within this framework, unless we sort out this maze, we have also come to realize 50 years of independence that we have to organize ourselves better. So this is, would like, you know, local markets are there, but how do you bring, if you are here, how do you come here? Global logistics companies, processing. I remember one day when I was still a student here, I visited, it's called the Swedish Banana Company. I don't know how many of you have visited that company. It's actually based here in Stockholm. That's why I was to learn that all the technology for the chiquita and things is on the ships, actually. You know, so from the farms, within 24 hours, they put the banana on the ships and it can remain there for two years. Nothing would happen because they have the technology. So global logistics is also part of this equation. Uh, so we are working on that model in Tanzania, but even more important is the framework of cooperation. We are and we remain a continent of farmers for some time to come. Since we, we feel that we can solve the urban challenge by improving uh, rural uh, incomes, but also by achieving what we call balanced territorial development, developing secondary towns. Everybody doesn't have to come to Nairobi or to Dar es Salaam or to Lagos. Lagos is already a mega city. Uh, in 20 years' time, Lagos will be the third largest city in the world. So you can imagine the challenge that will come with that. So how do you then develop our part of the world? We, we, are, we feel that we are welcoming investors. Why investors? Because we need capital and we need technology on this land. And at the moment, this is in short supply. So we would like to have the investor establishing a nucleus farm, surrounded by outgrower around the farm. So these smallholders will be able now to have access to service land in terms of infrastructure and irrigation, in terms of processing technology at the nucleus farm. The estate model has already been discredited. For those of you exposed to economic theory, you know that this is the export enclave model, bypasses everybody and nobody really gains anything. This has not worked. And you, in modern times, given the democratic processes, you, it is also a recipe for chaos, as we have seen in Zimbabwe. It is not sustainable. So the estate model will not work. But we feel that the nucleus model is the answer. Now, pure trader processor model, uh, that one also has its limitations. No demonstration effect, limited training technical assistance, limited understanding help with managing local climate, pests, etc. No skin in the game, just a middleman. So this is what was given within the context of the barrier report, structural adjustment, liberalization. It has not worked, it has not pushed rural development in Africa. Now, this model is on offer, and I must say that I have the privilege, when I went back to my country, left the UN and the president gave me this job, uh, I was happy and I had to sort of take a position on how we are we going to package this. There, there is increasing voices, particularly in the Western countries, and Sweden is one such, that we are parceling out land carelessly, the investors have taken uh, taken over the new colonization of African lands, could well be in some isolated pockets. But I can assure this audience that we are seized with the matter. But what we don't want is a purposeless sensation, because as I have said, we need to develop our rural areas. As matters stand now, Africa is a, a net food importing continent. So without international trade, Africa is not able to feed itself, despite the land. So we definitely we need capital on that land, we need technology on that land. So the question is not whether, but how we do it. And we are saying that we have to do it first and foremost for our own people. So to take you back to Tanzania, and uh, in doing that, let me recognize the audience of our ambassador. Ambassador Mzela is also in the room. Uh, this is... Why are we able to go to the south? Because we have a railway line. This is built by the Chinese. I think, Mr. President, at the lunch we were discussing China, and I said that China actually started engaging with Tanzania for quite some time. Uh, I think in their, when they opened up, when they started opening up their country in the 60s and 70s, 
Then they built this railway line in the context of providing a trade route for Zambia. So this is a famous Uhuru Railway built by the Chinese. It goes through a very difficult terrain, but it is able now to open up this corridor, so that's why we are starting with this agricultural corridor, the southern corridor. And the idea here is to promote smallholder agriculture, but within the framework of the nucleus farms, the people will come to invest. Now, for me, and here I am looking for support, and I am my, one of my jobs is land use planning, and as we speak now, only 10% of Tanzania is surveyed and titled. So we are in the process of uh, 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 putting up land use maps, because in Tanzania, before anyone can be given land, a large investor can be given any land in terms of the nucleus farm, we must first of all reserve adequate land for the smallholders. So to assure everybody, so we need to elaborate land use plans for all the villages before the land can be given out. It is an elaborate uh, work. Uh, two months ago, I was actually in this country visiting the, the land materiate in Yevle, because I know they exist here, and I was trying to see whether we can broker a partnership, take advantage of the recent uh, you know, GIS technology, and survey and map the lands, so that we know what is surplus and can be developed by those who are in a position to do so, but also what must be preserved for our own people. Now, on the final note, let me now very quickly also talk about the heart of Africa. This is Lake Victoria. A number of you have visited. This is Kampala. Not Nairobi is here, but this is Kisumu. This is Tanzania. I happen to be a member of parliament for this part. I was born here myself, in Maleba district. And when I decided to go home, the people had the kindness to elect me as their parliamentarian. So in that capacity, but also given my position, is that uh, Lake Victoria is a lake under siege. It is a very shallow lake. I don't have... Lake Tanganyika, for those of you familiar with the African map, is here with the six times more water than Lake Victoria. But this is the second largest lake in the world, I think after the Caspian Sea, but it is a shallow lake. The biggest threat to this lake is agriculture. As the populations have increased, people have started struggling to irrigate their farms. And as they do that, they do it without using the proper technology, so they are mining the wetlands. So this shallow lake depends on the wetland to minimize the sedimentation of the lake. So I would like really to invite the Stockholm Environmental Institute and SES. I would like also to recognize SES. I'm very sorry when I was writing this. <laughs> I was not aware that there was another partner. And all the, you know, the, the, the research community to, to revisit the future of Lake Victoria. Because I must have the humility to say that a number of attempts have been made, but I can speak that as a native of this area, it is my duty also representing the people who elected me into office to say that uh, it is a territory under siege. From environmental pressure, from population increases, but also from rapid and chaotic urbanization around the lake. So for some large growing cities, Kampala, Kisumu, the, hem, the original home of President Obama, Siaya, is not also far away from here, so at least he uh, is also part for Melinda and the other Americans in the room. This is <laughs> there is also some connection there. But this lake, this environment, is a fragile ecosystem, and in my view, requires international attention. It is the source of the Nile. Actually, the Nile originates from the Tanzanian part of the lake, called the Kagera River, if you remember the Amini War, the war was fought over this salient, which Amini has had annexed. The river just zooms through the lake, pushes to become the Nile. So with the sedimentation, the force, you know, of the, uh, the force of flowing water is being impaired, that could come to affect the Nile, which then goes all the way to North Africa. But also, towns like Mwanza here, uh, Kisumu on the Kenyan side, Kampala 
Some of the other towns emerging, they are now, this lake is operating as an open sewer. So sanitation systems need to be secured. But for agriculture, a challenge, simple interventions, if the farmers can protect the wetlands, we could well secure the future. So, my dear friends, my paper will be circulated. There is much more in my paper. But this is me and my father and sister, Wangari Masai, the, the day she won the, the prize. I went to see her at her house in Nairobi. Thank you very much for your kind attention.